The obesity epidemic in the United States is something that should concern all of us. And obesity is more a societal problem and attitude than it is an individual one. The American Religious Town Hall is now in session. Welcome, friends, to the American Religious Town Hall meeting, where the discussion of religious, political, and social issues is meant to promote the cause of religious freedom and to help us better understand each other. And now, here's your host and moderator, Pastor Jerry Lutz. I'm James Weingartner, still filling in for Pastor Jerry Lutz, and we're glad that you've joined us. It's a good day to discuss good subjects of people of, of common and good courtesy. And that's the point of this show. And we're gonna introduce our panelists to you this, mo this morning or afternoon, depending on when you're watching it. And we'll start with uh, John. My name is Canon John Peterson. I am an Episcopal priest and I'm canonically resident of the Diocese of Washington, DC. Hi, I'm Carl Troval. I am the professor, a professor of history and ethics at Concordia University in Austin, Texas. My name is Mel Robeck. I'm Senior Professor of Church History and Ecumenics and Special Assistant to the President for Ecumenical Relations at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena. I am also an ordained minister with the Assemblies of God. Hello, I'm Tony Matthews and I'm the Senior Pastor at North Garland Baptist Fellowship in Garland, Texas. Well, we have a good subject to discuss today and uh, it's one that's very relevant to all of us. The obesity rate in the United States stands at 42.4%. This is the first time that the national rate has passed the 40% mark. The national obesity rate has increased by 26% since 2008. Men's Journal states that the U.S. is the fattest country in the world. Many scholars now believe that the price for our unhealthy choices is the biggest threat to our overall economic stability and national security. If it's true that obesity results in more types of diseases, more types of cancer, high increases in coronary artery disease, type two diabetes, more severe strokes, and ultimately more death, why are we not doing more about it? We are guilty of self-indulgence to such a degree with fast food and caloric mass consumption that we are literally killing ourselves in a slow sugar-laced suicide. Our panel is asked to weigh in on the following questions. Number one, is it morally wrong to overeat? Two, what do different faiths teach about moderation and the admonition to healthy living? And three, how do we keep people from self-medicating with food? Help us. Okay, so we get to begin this discussion with Mel Robeck. Well, the first thing I want to say to our viewers is that we are not in the process here of fat shaming. None of us. We have talked about this before the show, and I think we're all in agreement that that's not what we are about. We are really about the health consequences of obesity in this country, and they are, are enormous. I travel a great deal in my ecumenical work around the world, and uh, I look at lots of cultures and I look at the diets that many of these cultures have and I find that the United States really has an, an issue, a real problem when it comes to obesity. When I look at uh, obesity here in the United States, I often think about regionalism and cultures uh, and subcultures that we find within the U.S. Uh, as I watch the Olympics in the past few weeks, uh, one of the things that I notice that is that everybody looks so svelte, you know. They all look like, well, you know, uh, the, the, the great, uh, the Greek gods as they were uh, styled in all of these statues that we see from ancient times. There were a couple that were quite over, oversized, I would say. You know, there were weightlifters and there were people who threw the hammer and there were those who did shot put. It takes a different kind of physique 
to do those kinds of things. They didn't run, they didn't swim, and so forth. The activity uh, that we find in athletes, I think, makes a great deal of difference in the way they're built and the, and the way they put on pounds or don't put on pounds. They need to eat. Everybody needs to eat. But I'm also caught by the reality that poverty often contributes to obesity. Because I think we're, we're stuck with people uh, in, in poverty situations uh, do not always have access to the, most, uh, the, to the best food that is available for them. Uh, they make poor decisions sometimes. Often, I would say, uh, they're not alone. Uh, you know, I live in the Los Angeles area where we have Hollywood, which tells us that everybody's supposed to be really skinny, and we live on the West Coast where everybody's supposed to be vegetarian, you know, all that kind of stuff. I don't think that's really helpful. Uh, I think what we do have is we have a super abundance of food in our country. We are very blessed at that particular point. Um, and I think we probably ought to be giving a lot more of it away than what we do. Uh, instead, we, we take it in. Uh, it's also the case, I think, that we have too much fast food uh, available in our country. You know, I think that the four food groups that I'm fo most familiar with is salt, sugar, fat, and starch. You know, and that's exactly what the fast foods are about, because those are the kinds of things where they can build, in a sense, an addiction to some of these kinds of things. And I do know that the, that many of the food companies that produce these fat foods, fast foods, <laughs> often often have done studies to to find out exactly how can we trigger this in an individual to get them to eat more or to eat more of our product. You know, so I think these are all very. Um, uh, significant issues that we need to face. But I, th I think the majority issue here in the United States, I think, has to do with poverty. You know, you can only live on rice and beans and tortillas uh, so long before it starts uh, take, having consequences on the weight side. Uh, you, you, you need more protein, you need less fat uh, in the diet. And I think that our churches could do a better job of helping our people. I mean, in my Pentecostal tradition, you know, we have a wide range, you know, and I can go in certain states and I know everybody's going to be overweight. Everybody is going to be overweight because the culture is such that that's the way they eat, that's the way they think, and, and uh, so forth. I'll go into other parts of the country and everybody's going to be very, very thin. And uh, it really has to do with training teaching, helping people to understand the outcomes of what we're supposed to be doing. I think um, it, what we, as, as, as a Christian, what I'm supposed to do, I suppose, is to help people to have a better quality of life. That's part of what we do. And so I think we could do much better a job in terms of helping people to understand the importance of watching our uh, weight by watching our diet. Thank you, Dr. Mill. Dr. Carl? Yeah, I'd like to reaffirm a lot of what Mel just said and in particular I, I'm glad that you took uh, in your response uh, a discussion about the nature of the context of the decisions in which we make eating choices. In other words so often being overweight, uh, being fat is or obese, however, whatever words you want to use is often blamed on the individual because that's what we like to do in America is if someone has a problem, they just need to make some decisions to get out of it and if we can just prov provide those options and yet, you're right, people who are poor don't have a choice. I mean, even when I go to the grocery store, I go, look at that, the healthiest thing that I can have is more expensive than the less healthy thing and I'm going, now, who's making this decision, right? And then, again, the salt, this is all designed to make us eat more. So this is why, to me, this is a much larger issue than blaming individuals for being fat. It's a whole societal consumption issue. I mean, we are a society that makes money by consuming things. The more we can get people to consume, the more money we can make. Food is no different. And I think this reflects a deeper problem in our capitalist system uh, that, that uh, we allow people to make bad choices, don't offer good choices to people in particular who need it. And poverty, I mean, amen on that. I, uh, and I, I, the other thing is that I think we have this false idea that we all have this kind of uh, res reservoir of willpower. <laughs> and willpower is really kind of a false, false thing. It isn't that we aren't free to make decisions, but most of us are too tired or too stressed to make good decisions. And so uh, when there are options that are not good for us, we tend to take them. Furthermore, when we start talking about issues like this, 
Immediately people move into shame as individuals. They move into guilt. And there may be some healthy purpose in that, but by and large, a lot of those kinds of feelings uh, make people uh, actually do worse. I just, depending on the assumption, let's see here, that, uh, that uh, getting people to think about their weight is a great way to help them lose weight, it really doesn't encourage weight loss, but actually it, they've discovered that people actually gain more weight when you're pointing out problems with weight. So you see, this is a, I, the thing is this issue goes so deep and we do need, and I think the church could do this in particular, to give people programs that help us to understand what it is to be a healthy eater and what does that look like and how can we find practical ways to become more healthy. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ken and John? Yes, I want to, I appreciate what both the, or my colleagues have said in their opening statements, and I really want to build on one aspect of what, and um, the subject I'd like to address in this is food security and obesity. Uh, for both of you discuss this, and I think that it is a critically important uh, thing for consideration, particularly for people of faith, uh, to be able to deal with this in the synagogue as well as the church and in the mosque. And we have a responsibility, I believe, to respond to these needs. The USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, has three different categories in relationship to food security. One is, and the best one, of course, is that food is accessible to everyone that people are able to eat healthily, be able to buy food that is healthy. But realistically, that isn't the case in many cases today. The second category is people who are worried uh, that food will, food will run out, that food bought will not last, and that they cannot afford to have a balanced diet. So that's your second category the people who have enough money to buy all the food they want and good food, et cetera. The, uh, then the third category is households that have low uh, food security. Uh, and when, in those cases, people have to cut out meals. They do not have money to be able to buy enough food. Or if they have enough money to buy some food, it's a food that has to last for a whole day. And so you might only have one meal a day, or you divide that one meal and actually have two meals out of what we would say one meal. Um, they eat less food because they simply do not have the money. And they're hungry because they did not eat. So it's a vicious circle that people are facing. And these are the main issues then that one has to face with regard to food security. This we have seen a great deal of actually since the pandemic began. Food lines, food banks simply cannot get enough food to be able to um, feed the people who simply do not have the money to be able to buy food. I remember seeing a huge long mile-long lines in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. people going to the food banks to be able to get enough money, to be able to get enough food so that they can feed their families. And so the COVID pandemic has certainly um, been a large factor in this, but also the fact that uh, during times of financial crisis and recession, people also are having this whole issue. And, and I suspect it sounds contradictory for us, when we think about uh, food insecurity or people not having enough money to buy food and the fact that we have obesity. Mm -hmm. Because one would think that if you're obese, you have plenty of food to be able to buy food. But as you have both pointed out so rightly, it, the types of food that you eat is what is absolutely critical. Yep. Thank you. Dr. Tony? Yeah, it's a very interesting topic. Um, um, Having pastored and ministered to people for a long time and unfortunately having quite a few funerals, um, I, I, I'm not ready to say that everyone who is um, obese or large is necessarily unhealthy. And I'm not ready to say that everyone who's thin <laughs> and small <laughs> is healthy right. um, because I've seen it both. And it's kind of I, I'm tr really trying to figure it out. So I think um, I think it's more about what you eat. Yeah. Um, 
how much you eat is very important, and we should definitely eat in moderation. But I think it's what we eat that is a major problem. Um, I spoke with a doctor a few years ago who came to the U.S. several years ago um, from a different country, and this doctor told me that she was shocked, exclamation point, to see the amount of sugar mm. that Americans eat. Mm -hmm. And she started talking to me about sugar. Of course, I was um, guilty and <laughs> convicted <laughs> and, um, because I love sweets. It's a, it's, it, it's, this is a problem. And let me say parenthetically that the church, I, someone needs to help the church. The church may not be able to help in this area because we need help. You know, all the nice food, the, the greens and cornbread and mac and cheese and the turkey and the, oh, Lord, I'm getting, I'm getting hungry now. So it's, 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 you know, we have, we eat. Um, so I, I think it's the choices we make. I, and then we binge eat as well. I read an article on binge, binge eating and the reason why we do so. And the top six reasons, um, they, they pointed to genes, um, family that, you know, we see our family members eat, parents, and we, it's a habit. Um, depression, low self-esteem, um, stress and anxiety, and, um, and then um, having these extreme diets, which, you know, you can lose a little bit of weight, but then after that diet is over, you just consume everything. So this is a topic here that I, I grapple with. Um, um, I, I went to the scripture, and of course we know about the passage that talks about gluttony. Mm. And then of course in Proverbs 25, it says, um, it asks the question, have you found honey? Um, eat only what you need, and, and don't eat it in excess. You know, so I think the, the application there is to consume enough for the need at the moment. But my gosh, I don't do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I love food. Um, when I read this, I said, oh, am I on this show? <laughs> you know, I, you know, I probably need to be out there listening, you know what I'm saying? And so, um, but, um, you know, we need help. We need help because obesity, obesity is a problem, and it leads to a lot of health um, issues. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to talk, but, uh, uh, you know, I, ha I, I watch my health pretty closely and I've been working for the last two years to bring a few pounds off and I've been relatively successful at that but it's required me to ha change in the way I uh, live not only what I eat or how much I eat I mean when you go to a restaurant these days in the US you know you're gonna get these oversized plates with these oversized dishes worth of food uh, you know I ate in a restaurant last night and I ended up leaving 50 percent of what I was served that's a terrible loss of food for somebody else that could have used it that I could not, you know. And I take my weight every single morning. I have a scale that goes within a tenth of a pound, and it goes right directly to the doctor's office, and he knows exactly what I have wow. done and what I haven't done. And it amazes me. I mean, it goes up two pounds. It goes down two pounds in a single day. And it has to do with consumption. If I've had a little bit too much salt, the water's going to stay there, you know, and, and so forth. So, but to, to watch that on a day-by-day -day basis, I've been able to bring it down slowly, so that I have lost 35 pounds, and I'm very happy with that, although I need to lose more, according to my doctor, you know? I mean, the, the, and the fact is, I mean, I'm borderline diabetic, you know, so I have to watch my sugar. You know, all those kinds of things are really helpful, and they are health-related. They're not uh, simply because I love to eat food. I do, but I, you know, uh, but I do have a little self-control. Yeah. <laughs> my biggest problem is my wife. Oh, she no. serves me oh, more than I can take, and yeah. I keep telling her, and then she thinks, well, don't you like my cooking? Yes, of course <laughs> I like your cooking, but I just can't eat this much. Thank sure, you, Mel. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not really a panelist here, uh, but I, I did want to say that from my, uh, my faith tradition, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have a, a whole part of our faith that deals with mm -hmm. health. And uh, as a result, uh, you can study the blue zones of Loma Linda, California and different things like that. And, and we believe it's really integral that we want the, uh, our, our faith to heal the whole man or woman. And so that's, it's, it's important and, and others can look into that. Let's go to a break and we'll be right back. We hope you are enjoying today's program. 
If you would like to learn more about the American Religious Town Hall, please visit our website at AmericanReligious.org. That's AmericanReligious.org. There you can read about the mission and history of the program, learn about the Town Hall Estates, and view past programs by clicking the appropriate menu buttons. Each week, Pastor Lutz looks forward to receiving your letters. You may write to him at the address shown on your screen. Send your letters to Pastor Jerry Lutz, American Religious Town Hall Meeting, P.O. Box 180118, Dallas, Texas, 75218. That's Pastor Jerry Lutz, American Religious Town Hall Meeting, P.O. Box 180118, Dallas, Texas, 75218. Thank you for writing, and thank you for watching. And now, back to you and today's closing statements. And we really do want to hear from you. Anything that we can do to uh, bring to light important subjects with our panelists. We have some extremely gifted and wise uh, uh, panelists that can discuss subjects. And if you have a subject for us, please let us know. Uh, it's time for our summations, and we begin, as always, with John. Thank you so very much. An important topic. I would like to say a couple words that I had not planned to say, but listening to this discussion today. I think that it is really important that when our churches or synagogues or our mosques have food drives, that we simply don't go downtown and buy, or to the grocery store, and buy heavy starch foods, more pasta, but to have quality food that is really healthy for people to be able to have. Why do we send out and give the cheapest food that we can when we are really should be very concerned about the health of the people who are re is receiving this? Because they're not getting it because uh, they're poor necessarily, but because of economic circumstances at a particular time in a particular place, like during the pandemic. I also want to be able to say three, five, point out five subgroups in our population that are most uh, uh, significantly uh, impacted because of food insecurity. And I must say, I was really surprised when I read this in the USAD report. Number one, women, but not men, women. Two, those people who have some college education. Three, or they've graduated from college. Imagine. Four, those with no children. And five, families that have two children in the household. Those are the people who suffer most from food insecurity. Thank you. Mel? That's difficult for me to see. Uh, I, some of it I, I understand, but it seems to me that uh, our aged population often suffers from food insecurity as well, uh, especially those on fixed income and, and the like. Uh, but my sense is, and I, and I really want our audience to know this, that, that we're not coming down on you. What we're simply suggesting is this is a huge problem, and it's a huge problem for our healthcare industry. Uh, our insurance premiums go up, our hospital stays are longer, you know, all those kinds of things all result from the fact that we don't pay much more attention to the foods that we eat and the amounts that we eat and so forth. Yes, self-control is part of that. But I also recognize that within especially these communities, such as you've just pointed out, and, and, and our concern about people in poverty who are limited to the kinds of things. I have a store that's... Uh, that's uh, uh, sister store to one of the other stores where I normally shop. Uh, and uh, it, this one is aimed very close to the Latinos and the African Americans that live within the community where I live. Uh, the, the, the difference in the quality of those two stores is enormous. And yet, the, the one that's uh, closest to me, where these poorer people are, has the higher prices. I find that extremely difficult to, to tolerate. But the reality is, that's what, that's what it's about. It's about the dollars and cents. The dollars and cents. Thank you, Mel. Tony? Yes, um, you know, drinking and driving, you know, that gets a lot of attention because it's dangerous. You can hurt other people. And um, doing drugs is dangerous. You can hurt other people doing that and with your family. And when we think about overeating, it's just not a, it's, it's not something that is a, a, an immediate direct consequence. Um, that can be hurtful to other people. And I think that's one reason why 
it doesn't get a whole lot of play. It doesn't, you know, it's almost celebrated in some places. You know, mm -hmm. hey, get a big plate, you know, and, and it's celebrated. It's just a non-issue. And so because of that, I think we have to um, have more accountability. It's been mentioned um, um, earlier. We have to be accountable. We have to be intentionally accountable. We have to set these accountability measures in place because it can really lead to bad health when we overeat. We need to be um, disciplined, um, and that's easier said than done. I'm talking to myself. Just um, um, Dr. Robeck talked about the discipline. Most of us just don't have that discipline until it's, quote, too late, unquote, too late when we get really ill and you just are forced to. We want to have that discipline before the illnesses set in. And then from a um, pastoral, ministerial perspective, um, I think eating healthy, we, 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 we should look at this as um, something that prolongs our ministry. We don't want to short circuit our ministry by eating bad that will adversely affect our health. So I think we, we, we should do that. Thank you. Carl? Yeah, uh, my wife and I participated in a program that came out of our health, uh, our health insurance. Because your, your insurance health companies, if you have health insurance, are very interested in your being healthy. And a lot of them have programs. And this one, it was called Naturally Slim. It was actually quite helpful. We have, uh, I know four people, including my wife and myself, have lost pretty significant weight on this. And honestly, the principles are so simple. Uh, and a lot of it is, is that you got to get your, you have, they had ways of strategies of dealing with family who keep offering you things, um, you know, and, and when you go out to eat with your friends at lunch. But the one was, is that you can have a big piece of chocolate and a tiny little chunk of chocolate. And guess what? You get the same flavor impact by having exact, by having a lot less of something. So it wasn't about denying yourself. It was just about being conscious and then stopping partway through because your belly actually gets fuller uh, later than your mind does. Mm -hmm. And so you have to wait and then you feel full. And just that pacing, we lost, I mean, I lost like uh, 17 pounds, right? Doing that. It was amazing. Uh, thank you, panelists. Uh, I mean, it, I was just fine with this discussion until he touched on chocolate. You can't be doing that now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about chocolate now. Okay. <laughs> the Charter of the American Religious Town Hall provides that Roman Catholics, Protestants, Jews, educators, and others may appear on this program and can declare their beliefs without hesitancy. The rest of the members of the panel will uphold and guarantee that American right to all who will appear, irrespective of race or creed, so that the rest of the world can see that here in America we believe in civil and religious freedom, not only in theory, but in reality. And now, friends, until next week at the same time and over the very same channel, the Relig American Religious Town Hall meeting stands adjourned. May the God of all of us bless all of you.